Well, let's have a word of prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And boy, I'll tell you, you can't live it in carnality or in the flesh. It gives no opportunity for any great things for God to do in the flesh. But in the spirit, in the spirit, taking the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, he can do things you could never imagine. And once again, I was reminded of how powerful the word of God is when it's activated by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, in all kinds of circumstances of life. And so I'm telling you, Bible study begins in the classroom and then it extends itself in application to real life experience. And boy, does it ever work, work and you know that. And so you can't, you can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Carnality can take many sh shapes and forms. It can be a lack of courage, a lack of discipline. It can, I'm reminded as I traveled around the floors of the high school visiting, or the hospital visiting with people, listen, carnality can come in a lot of different forms than what we might think, like just sin, like, well, some kind of fleshly sin, some, some sin that I would never want to commit. And listen, it could come through so many different avenues, being dispirited. There's just a lot of things a lot, of, a lot of different ways you might not think. So let's have a word of prayer. The, the, the access back, evidence, of course, evidence of carnality is personal sin. And the way you deal with that and get back to a spiritual journey is confession of that sin according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, it could be mental attitude. It could be sins of the tongue or reverse sins. In the hospital, I can tell you it's loaded up with mental attitude sins. And a lot of these people are believers and do not know that the way they're approaching their disability or their problem is carnal and through a mental attitude sin. And that was kind of enlightening to me. So I give you a moment. Confess your sin if necessary. Mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, avert sins. And let's do our study. Father, we're so thankful for your marvelous grace, for the strength that you give to the weak, hope to the hopeless. How important, Father, is your word. It is the fuel that keeps us running. It is that power that lifts us out of discomfort and despair, hopelessness. Hopelessness. I pray today, Father, the message is Jesus the Christ. Who is this man called Jesus? Is he the Christ? Is, is he the one we're looking for to be the Savior of our life in time and eternity? These are fair questions. We'll answer them today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when you read the birth story, you may not think about this. You only meet a few people that believed that Jesus was the Christ. I, I mean a handful, not, not two handfuls. I'm talking about a handful. And one of the things we find interesting today as we journey through our life is how many people do not know. A lot of people know who Jesus is. They don't know who he is. He, they, 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 know, they know about Jesus, but they don't know who he really is. They don't know who he really is. And it was amazing to me this week as I journeyed around to discover that. If you say to somebody, do you know Jesus? 99% of the people can tell you yes. But what do they know about him? And this story today is about that. And I find this story really interesting because it is the Christmas story, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus the Christ? Is he the one that God had set aside to be the Savior of the world and the hope of time and eternity? Is he? Mm. 
And here's what's interesting. When we go to Matthew 16, as we will right now, he's in Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16. In Philippi, you will see as, as we get into the passage uh, in verse, and by the way, I know Matthew is not Maddie. I know that. It could become anything after five days in the hospital. Um, but you can see it in verse 13. And we are, we are about, just to give you an idea, when he asked this question, give me a heads up. I, I, want, I want you to, uh, when I say a heads up, I want you to look at me. They were one year from his death. They're about one year from his death. If you read on, you would see the next thing he's going to do with them is a transfiguration with Peter and guys like that. You'll know why he picked Peter to go with him. You'll know why he picked Peter to be with him. But here he is one year. He's been heavy in his ministry with these guys. I mean, heavy. Heavy in Bible study, heavy in miracle work. Is heavy, 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 heavy. You know, if you need miracles, you travel with Jesus. If you need to see the reality of the power of God, you travel with Jesus. There are a lot of reasons you travel with Jesus. But if you want to see the supernatural happen in front of your very eyes, you travel with Jesus. Whether you're one of his disciples or if you heard it was in the neighborhood, you came out and followed because you wanted to see. I tell you, when your life is dependent and your spiritual life is dependent on the spectacular and you miss God in the everyday life, you've, you're on the wrong journey. Those people that just wanted to see the spectacular, they wanted to see the power of God spectacular and didn't pay any attention that to the person of Jesus Christ and who he was from a biblical standpoint did, never were followers. They were followers of miracles. They were followers of the visual sight. They were followers of sight and not faith. Don't become that person. Don't become that person. It is a journey of misery and doubt and despair. He's one year. He's been, he's been in heavy teaching with his disciples. Now he's in his last year. He's at Caesarea Philippi, and he's now into revealing to his disciples who he is. Because they haven't got it after two years. They really don't know who Jesus is in his person personal identity in the Bible, they don't know it. Oh, they know that he, he's a great teacher. Oh, they know that he's a miracle worker. Oh, they know he's from God, but they don't know who he is biblically. And how do I know that? Because the whole thing in the Bible that he would die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and they missed it. So I'm not talking crazy talk here today. Be sure you're not one of those type of disciples. They traveled with him 724s and didn't get it. And so here we are one year out. And boy, this last year is going to be a year. They've been on the gravy train. They're going to be on the death train this last year. He sets him down at Caesarea Philippi. And listen to what he says to him. Who do people say the Son of Man is? See, they knew that the word, the biblical word Son of Man means when, Jesus, when Christ is on the earth. That's an earthly term for his earthly mission. When he says, so when you read him say the Son of Man, it means his flesh on the earth in fulfilling a mission for God. When he's called the Son of God, that's the bigger picture of who he really is, the Son of God. He is from eternity past to eternity future. Son of man is who he is on earth. It is the Son of man that dies on a cross for your sin, is buried and raised from the dead. That's what the question is that he wants answered. Who is, who do people say the Son of man is? You see, the, the masses through John the Baptist's great ministry, has identified Jesus as the Son of Man. Even John was confused about what that really meant 
when John too was looking for the kingdom to come. Right? And before he died, he asked some very serious questions. And the Lord gave him some very serious answers. So he wants to ask his disciples because they're connected with the popular. Listen, when he says, what do people say? He's saying, what does the pop, what's the popular opinion? Because the disciples were all about popular opinion. Not scriptural opinion. Well, they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, who was to come, and still others, Jeremiah, and still others say one of the prophets or the prophet connected with the Moses idea. The one thing is that they're all in the same idea, but here's what they all agree on. He's a prophet. John the Baptist, a prophet. Elijah, a prophet. Jeremiah, a prophet. And another prophet. He is the sum total of any prophet that you could think of. Not long ago, talking to a Muslim, he knew a great deal about Jesus Christ, the prophet. And I use this passage. That's a wonderful idea. But that's not why he's came. It is true that he was a great teacher and a great prophet. And he had all the characteristics of a great prophet to Israel. But that's not who he was. And so I got a chance to share the rest of the story that I'm sharing with you today. Then he says to the, his disciples, watch this now, the question I ask you today, but who do you say that I am? Because, listen, he didn't buy that one. Or he wouldn't have said, then who do you say I am? He'd have just said, well, that's good, boys. It looks like that's, that's so good. That's a good thing. That's not what he did. No, no. He said, okay, you've taken the popular opinion. Now let me get yours. What's your private opinion? I mean, who is, Jesus? who is this Jesus the Christ in your life? Is he just, I mean, who is he? Boy, he better be at all. I mean, he better be your knight. Now I lay me down to sleep, and the next morning when I rise to do his work, not just when I'm in a rest position, but when I'm in a work position, he's got to be there. Is that the, is that the Jesus, the Christ you know? The one who was there when you're asleep and the one who was there when you're awake in your soul? Well, who, who do you say am? Simon Peter answered immediately, Thank you, Peter. I'll tell you who you are to me. Because that's what he asked, right? I want each of you guys to tell me who, who do you think I am. Peter first went out, didn't hesitate. The rest of them are trying to get the right answer. Let me see what answer he wants, right? Did you hear what I just said? So many of us want to give people the answer they, they want to hear. When you Listen, when he asks that question, he wants to hear the truth. I don't want you to tell me what you think I want to hear. I want you to tell me the absolute truth. That's the difference of whether or not you're really truthful with people or whether you're not. Simon Peter immediately told him who he thought he was. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are thou, or blessed are you, Simon Barjona. He connects him with his father.
Blessed are those, Simon Barjona. You've had great training in your life. Because, and here's why he's blessed. Because, this is the reason, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You know what that is? That's spiritual enlightenment. That's Ephesians 1.18. That's spiritual enlightenment. You do not get spiritual enlightenment unless you have the Word of God in your soul. Listen to me. That's called reveal. When Jesus asked that question, the word of God about the truth of who Jesus was for Peter was right there in his conversion. Right there in his conversion. Not in his growth, in his conversion. It's where it all starts. That's the baby information, the revelation that you've been born again by believing that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised on the dead third day. And now you have spiritual enlightenment to truth. And when he asked that, he went back to the basic truth, the foundational truth that we all have, and that is our conversion, our salvation. I believe that God, would, right, that Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And that becomes consolidated in my life and becomes the foundation of my belief system. But what Peter did not believe was that he was not going to give him the kingdom right now. Because when Jesus, see, verse, chapter 16 is when Jesus begins to reveal to his disciples He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be trialed through two, both the Jewish and the Gentiles church, uh, court system. Crucified, buried, and raised on the third day. But what he does believe is that he's, he, he came to be the Savior. Flesh and blood. Did not reveal this to you. It wasn't some guy just teaching. But it was the scriptures that you heard and believed that were now actively engaged in your soul about what you believe is true and not true. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, Peter, and then he goes into the discussion, which I'm going to, I'm going to teach you later, not today. I'm going to come back to this subject matter, and I'm going to teach you what he taught him. He said, well, Peter, you're almost right, but not quite. Yeah, do you hear me? You're almost right, Peter, but you're not quite. And so he goes on in verses 18 through 20 and lays it doctrinally out for him. Peter, you've got enough information. You've got the foundation. You're saved. You understand that. Thank you, the living God, the living God. Thank you, Peter. But listen, you're only, you only partial right. You only got half the story. You only got half the picture. And so he puts them back in the classroom based on the foundation doctrine. He begins to try to build up on that premise. This was the first true Christmas for the disciples who learned that Jesus is the Christ and that Christ is the only reason for Christmas. Notice I'm, I put you bold print on Christ. You take Christ out, you don't have anything. That's what we've done with our school systems, our, edu our, whole, our whole system in America, even in the South, we're, being, we're, we're buying into this stupidity of taking Christ out of the market square. That's where he works. No, keep him inside the church. Don't let him into the community. Let him go to the graveyard, but don't let him go to the city. That's, that's, that's the culture. The South must rise up again, people. The church of Jesus Christ must not permit that. They must not. They're, they're working to take us out of the public square. They want to keep us in the cemetery. Listen, it's all about the street. 
It's all about where people live and where they work. Where their life is lived out is where Christ is the most dynamic. Boy, I, I, I was reminded this week as I walked the halls of the hospital how right Chuck Farmer was. The greatest ministry to needing people is the hospital. Boy, was he right. What's going to happen from chapter 16, if you go on and read this in, chapter, in verse 21 and on, you're going to see Jesus begins to build on that statement Peter made, which wasn't, a, that was a baby. What Peter said was a great statement, but it came from the foundation of faith, not from great doctrine. Jesus had to teach Peter the great doctrine that fit in that. Peter, you've, only, you've got a foundation, you don't have any house, so let me give you the first floor. <laughs> That's well worth your read, and I'm going to come back and do a study on that for sure. Let me get to point one. I'm going to teach you two points tonight. Now, remember this. This is 30 years out from the birth story. We are 30, we are 30 years out from the birth story. Are you with me? And these people are still struggling with that. Point number one, I'm back to the birth story. Here's Mary. And I'm thinking, why, isn't people, why aren't people teaching all that? Why is there such a gap between the birth story and Matthew 16, the one year before he goes to the cross? Well, anyhow, that's the gap I'm trying to fill with you. Mary received a spiritual field promotion by God for the ministry of God that was about to be revealed to her by Gabriel's salutation in Luke 128. I have already taught you this. Gabriel shows up, the archangel, you talk about the teacher of Messiah. Greetings, favored one, perfect passive participle. Remember that? The perfect tense shows her spiritual identity, her, her informational level. She's not on the foundation, she's on the top floor. She, Peter, when he makes his statements, on the, is on the foundation. He's standing on the foundation of what could be a great building, which is called the church. Mary, her spiritual ability to receive the Son of God in motherhood, she's on the top floor of information in regard to that assignment. That's the perfect tense. The pass, that's the, the passive voice shows that what the salutation means to her is her field promotion. She has no idea how spiritual she is. If you'd ask Mary in her humility, she would have never said, penthouse, I'm way up here. I mean, who does that? No, I, I don't know. I'm just a field worker. I just work in the field. I don't run the business. I don't know. God tells her. When he says you're the favored one, you cannot believe. That's high status. That's high cotton in the South. That's high status. Favored one. She wouldn't have believed. Listen, God saved that word just specially. She is one that has been graced and understands the level of grace that comes to her life. She don't, like, she don't go pat herself on the back and say, whoa, boy, I really did a good thing here. She don't wait for other people to pat her on the back and say, oh, you've done a good job. She's there with God. Favored one, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And boy, is she going to need that encouragement. What the participle teaches here about favored one is that she has the spiritual capacity through her growth, inhale, exhale of the word of God through the faith cycle, she has the spiritual capacity to do the assignment that she's about to be given because it's going to be, listen, here's what the average guy would say, over her head, right? Where is she in the building structure? Penthouse. She's in the top floor. There can't be, listen, you are too. You are here. You said a year or two with me, you're there. If you're taking it serious, you'll be there. 
you won't be struggling with growth anymore. You will struggle with the application of growth. This is what we talk about. Put off the old man, put on the new man. He, he, we're not talking to babies. We're talking to mature believers. You can't talk to baby believers, new converts that way. They don't understand what you're talking about. And listen, whatever assignment God gives you, you're right. You have all the spiritual capacity to do it. Even though, even though you might think the assignment is over your head. It, could it possibly, can it be over your head? Can the assignment truly be over your head? Tell me no. And if it is, from a biblical standpoint, not from an emotional standpoint, not an emotional standpoint, not looking by sight at what all is piling up, but looking at what God wants to do, what power he wants to reveal through your life, what great things he wants to show you, the view. I was, listen, when I was on the 10th floor, I looked out the window and I realized why they call it Grand View. That's what you want. The, he, when, you, when he gives you that assignment, he wants you to get up to the seventh floor or the 10th floor, wherever the penthouse, and he wants to reveal to you. He wants to reveal to you from the Father in heaven, wants to reveal to you. Flesh and blood doesn't do that. The Father in heaven reveals it to you. Come on now, people. Huh? Huh? I just read that. Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You got the grand view view. Listen, he's going to put assignments on your, ta on your desk. He's going to put assignments on you. When you look at them in the natural, <coughs> it's going to be, it's going to, in the natural man, it is overwhelming. Listen, of course it is. It's not to be done in the flesh. It's not blood and flesh. Of course it's going to be that way at first look. But at second look in the word of God, when you look at it spiritually, okay, Father, Father, Father. Then you're looking at it, the revelation of it from the Father of heaven. Here you on the 10th floor, which is greater than the first floor, and yet God is above that. Light years. Are you with me? Always look up. Don't look down. When you look down, it will scare you to death. Look up and you'll see the vision that God has for your life. You are never overwhelmed. You say, well, I would, did you choose that? I, Ron, I would have never chose that. <laughs> What's on my plate, I would never choose. This would never be the path that I would have chose. God chose it for me. And when you get to that place where you can look out from the 10th floor and look up. Then he will reveal to you the magnificent. Then he will say to you, he will say to your heart, you're so blessed to be able to be in a position where I've put you, where you know you need me 100% of the time for your oxygen. I will breathe such life into your bones. I will breathe life into you in a way that you have never known before. You do know that. And some of us have been through that, haven't we? And listen... That's just the beginning. And sometimes these are great things, and sometimes they're tough things, you know, as we evaluate. And so this is what he's telling her in her salutation. This spe special salutation means that Mary has reached spiritual maturity necessary for the assignment of a special ministry from God. This is, listen to me now. I want you to circle. I put Philippians 3 what, 14, uh, 13, 14, may, maybe even 15. And I, I want you to know, this is a verse that's designed for you when you get there. This is what, this is the verse. When you get there, this is your verse. Listen to what it says. One thing I do, this is Paul now. 
If you know anything about who wrote the book of Philippians and when he wrote it, this is called a prison epistle. And if you know why it's called a prison epistle, what circumstances Paul's life was in and his relationship with God and everything, this is a powerful statement. Listen to what Paul said. One thing I do. Now, when you're really struggling and you get somebody who's been through it before, and he says, well, let me tell you the one thing I did, you listen to him, don't you? <laughs> you lean in. Forgetting what lies behind. We don't, we don't walk that road again. We're not, we're not walking that road again. And stretching forward, pressing forward, or reaching forward to what lies ahead. I'm not, I'm not looking at going down. I'm at the penthouse. I'm not looking down. I'm not looking forward to going down to the 7th, 6th, and 5th. No, no. I, I'm looking up. I'm not looking down. One thing I do, I forget what's behind me, and I, I press forward to what's ahead of me. I press onto upward to the upward goal that's set before me, the prize of the high calling of Christ. What am I stretching forward? What am, what am I forgetting? Well, all those, all those mistakes, all those things, all that, nah, let it go. <laughs> let it go. As I, let it go. That's, that happened on the fourth floor. Well, what about this? Well, that happened on the sixth floor. What about this, the seventh? That, then we're not there anymore. We're on the tenth floor. We're not there anymore. Now, I'm not paying attention where I, what got me here, what all the mistakes I made, and yada, yada, yada. No, no. I'm now looking forward. I'm moving forward. See, a lot of times we get stuck somewhere. We get stuck on the fourth floor. We can't work the elevator. We can't do anything. We just get stuck. Look it. Here's, here's what pushes the button. Forget what's behind. And let's move ahead. Are you moving ahead? Are you stuck someplace? I can tell you how you know you're stuck because it keeps coming over and over and over again. Every time you get in a bind, you go like, well, that's probably what it was, something behind me. Man, you're the only one sticking yourself anywhere. Don't do that. God never calls to ministry that which he has not prepared to bring to completion with you. The Lord will, Lord will be with you. That's why you can move forward. There's some great Bible there verses for you. Point two. God's assigned ministry for Mary can only be accomplished by God's grace. Now, she knew that, but she knew it in a physical sense. He says to her, you're going to have a baby. She says, well, sir, <laughs> I'm a virgin, and I know how this thing works. I've had the lesson on the birds and the bees. I'm a virgin, and I know how this works. And uh, so how's this going to work? Right? Did she not ask that? Of course she did in that Luke passage. And so he tells her, she, you know, she's right there at the place where she needs to be coached, prepped, taught up. He said, well, let me, let me fill in some of the information for you. You're on the right floor. Let me just fill in some information. And so he gives her this, this great instructions about it. You know, the, you, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will have this miraculous conception. And, and he goes on. He fills in. It's not like new information. It's just filling in where she is. Well, how can that be on that? And he goes like, and you know what's interesting to me? He never quoted Isaiah 7.14 to her. And I thought that interesting because she would have gotten it. Joseph got it. It took that to get him in. But he didn't. That would have been too easy for him. It wouldn't have answered questions. Oh, please listen to me. It's not wrong to have questions. 
is to have the questions after you've had the answers. <laughs> and he answers her questions to fill in the gaps of future questions. That's what Bible study does for you if you pay attention. I wouldn't want a Christian to serve me any more than I would a doctor who slept through all the medical classes. Would you want to have a doctor who slept through all the medical classes and got his degree out of a Cracker Jack box? I wouldn't. Sometimes I think I got one, but what do I know? I wouldn't want to be that preacher either. Listen, here's the great line I, I love that he gave her. Now, he's going to give her information that would take care of future questions. Are you with me? He said, you're going to be uh, over, over the shadow power and then the Holy Spirit power, and you're going to have a, a baby boy, and you're going to call, call him this, and he will be Emmanuel, God with us. And he approached her in a biblical way, but he approached her with a different, a different set of scriptures. But the reason he did, the reason he coached her was to fill in some of the question, the gaps of questions from the first one. Let's, let's just clear it all up until the baby comes. And that was really good teaching, and it, it's a great, a great way. But in verse 37 of Luke 1, 37, he says, listen, the, impo the impossibilities with you, blood and flesh, are the possibilities with God through Scripture. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. According to the Scriptures, according to the Word, nothing is impossible. According to the Word, nothing is impossible with God. Isn't that wonderful to know? Nothing. Because sometimes you get in this place where just a thousand things well, what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? They're all about what, what about the impossibilities. And to be able to stay focused on the possibilities with God is the secret. Listen to me. Looking where? Above. Looking where? Above. When you're looking at below you're dealing with the impossibilities that you know can occur through blood and flesh. It sounds so simple and trite. I, I'm afraid you won't believe it. Listen to Paul, 1 Thessalonians 1.3, because she has the capacity. We ought always to give thanks to you, to God for you, brethren, as only fitting, because, reason, watch this, because your faith is greatly enlarged. That word is where we get super grace from in the scriptures. That's hooper is super, and oxano is the word grow. That's super growth. We call that super grace. That is the spiritual capacity to take any assignment God gives you and max it. Max it. Always looking above. Never looking behind. Not looking at the impossibilities, always looking at the possibilities. The possibilities that God will show you. And God, how does he work the, the impossible to possible? He works it through grace. It comes from heaven, so to speak, not from earth, so to speak. Not flesh and blood. It comes from your heavenly Father. Your Abba Father. And then he says, and watch this. And when you get there, this is where the colonel always put love at the top of the structure of your soul, the edification complex. Of he started with the foundation of salvation. He went up floor one, two, three, four, five, the edification complex. He always put up there. You know what he put up there? Love. You know where he got it? Right there. And when you get there, you max out love. You're a, you're a, you have the capacity to love under any condition, at all conditions, any place, any time, any person. Think about that. That's a hard one, too. Notice this. 
because, and he gives two things. He gives two things that people miss. One, because your faith is greatly enlarged, that's having the spiritual capacity through, through super grace, and, and, that's an adjunctive conjunction, and the love of God grows even greater. Notice he changed the word, which means rapidly increase. <clears throat> this word in the Greek language that is on your paper means to rapidly increase. <clears throat> Look, here's what he's saying. When you get there, God is going to start giving you assignments. <clears throat> they operate off from two basic principles from the penthouse. Faith, you always have the capacity to do what God provides. Nothing's impossible. Don't look that. Don't look at the bottom floor. Look at the top. Look at what's above you. Who is oper whose operation is this? When you look above, there's no more floors. <laughs> Who is it? God, your Father. It, see, He makes the impossible the possible. Your spiritual growth, taking Bible doctrine into it, growing, is where you get to have the capacity that it doesn't matter anymore. I don't have to tell that person, stop looking behind you and start looking at that. Listen, they've quit that. That's such a stupid, futile event in your life. Going back to where the dog vomited. Quit it. Live where you are in the capacity you have. Always looking above it because there's where the impossible that you face becomes possible with God. It's called grace. It's called grace. It's not called flesh. It operates supernaturally through your capacity of all this Bible doctrine you have in your soul. And what, what will be the earmark from it? Listen, you know what they call the penthouse? The love place. The love place. Every home should have a love place. Right? Maybe one other than the kitchen. How about that? The top of your capacity that operates by faith, that you just hang in there and walk by faith and not by sight, you become the epitome of love to other people. You meet that need. I can't tell you how many times my wife, from her hospital bed, Encourage young women to reconnect with their mothers in a love relationship. And over the five days, you would be surprised how many came back and hugged her little neck and said, I can't begin to tell you, I went home last night and I told her mother, I am so thankful that you helped me to get into my career base. I love being in the hospital. And I met this woman that said, I should come back and tell you how appreciative I am and that I love you. I love the woman that you've been in my life for me. And she would come back and she said, they would be all giggly and with her and say, I cannot I went home last night and I took, my wife never gave her any advice to go home and do that. She said, Dad, I bet your mama's proud of you like I am. And that little white layered woman said that to her and hugged on her. And she went home and said to her mother, and she'd come back and go like, oh, Miss Jane, you're so right. And then she's starting to bring other, other girls in. You got to meet Miss Jane. Miss Jane, tell her. And we had some of the most wonderful stories. What is that, Ron? That's this passage. That is this exact passage. As is only fitting that your faith fits the need for the moment. And it's, it's captured by your love for them. It's captured in love. Your faith is captured in the way you treat people, in love. It is supernaturally produced. It is a love experience. And it just naturally flows. It, it, you don't set up, well, I got to do that. It's none of that. It just naturally flows. And, and the response is just enormous. The response is just enormous. Well, I hope you got time to do a little homework because 
I'm through with my lesson. But there's a great exercise. Be sure to read. Be sure to read the Luke passage as you go around the faith faith cycle. It will surely help you, as it has me. It will surely help you. I want you this Christmas to have a joyful Christmas. I want you to view it from the penthouse of your spiritual growth. I don't want you to look at the impossibilities this year. There, are, Listen, if in the natural person, there could be, for us as a church, we could have so many impossibilities this year coming. And listen, they'll be the most exciting. Don't look at that way. That's looking back. Don't go there. You're in the penthouse. Look up. Look for the possibilities. There's a world of difference in looking at something impossible and possible. Would you agree? You don't have to always have the things before you to know it's possible. Because that's called grace. He gives it to you as you need it. We're about to enter in a, a new year, and we have got to move from impossibilities to possibilities. I'm going to tell you, that's where the great ministry... Let the love capture the people. Let the love capture the people. Don't worry about where we've been or what we've done. Let's look at the future. Let's look above. Flesh and blood can't reveal it, but the Heavenly Father will. He will absolutely do it, as, as I have. I pray, Father, reveal that from the heaven side. I don't want to look at the earth side, but reveal to me from the heaven side the things I can't see that I can believe in. And so I find that to be encouraging in my life. I want you to find that. I want you to find it in your personal life. I mean, many of you are going through a lot of different struggles in your life right now. Maybe in helping family members in your life. And changes, changes. We hate changes, and I know that. You know, you just retired and going to something else, and what am I going to do? I dealt with a man this, this, this week in that state. But look, don't live in the impossibilities. Live in the possibilities and have joy in the journey. That's what I say. Have joy in the journey. Will it, be, will it not be without difficulty? No. Will it not be a difficult? Yes, 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 and yes. Look above. Stop looking behind. Look ahead and then press towards it because you have the capacity. I want your eyes and I want your heart to feel that grace can be sufficient in every need that you have in your life. And when it does, it will impact others by the way you treat them in love. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today. We thank you, Father, for all. I mean, this is a season of joy, and I've seen so many people discouraged already. Thinking, oh, this is going to be a terrible Christmas. I'm not going to be home. You can have a wonderful Christmas without being home. It depends on what home is. Maybe it's where the heart is. Maybe it's where the heart is. And so our Father encourages. This Christmas, let's, let's be that. Somebody rings our doorbell. It's a joy to respond. Let us be. The person who walks by faith and not by sight. Let us be what Christmas is about, and that's love. It's, it's about the gift, not gifts. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.